Oh, wait a second. I'm going to try that again. Share. Hmm. All right, not exactly what I was hoping for, but this works. Okay, everybody. So last class, we focused on the shift from the rabbinic period to the medieval period, and we really focused on Maimonides, the Rambam. And this, this class, we're taking the, the fork in the road. We're taking that fork. Um, and rather than going toward the mosaic Torah's medieval expression in philosophy, we're taking medieval's expression of the priestly Torah as it has been filtered through the rabbinic time period um, into the Middle Ages. And you will notice that there are there is a plural, the priestly Torahs. So that is the surprise ending that I will tease you with now. We are having a surprise ending. Okay, so we are getting a running start. So we are in rabbinic literature. We are in the Babylonian Talmud and the and the Midrash, Genesis Rabbah. And we have um, vestiges of the priestly Torah, but not only in Halakha, not only in rabbinic law, but also in Agadah, in theology. So on the left, you will see this notion of vicarious atonement. So not only do the offerings effect atonement, according to the first Agadah, but even the clothes, the vestments that the priest wears affects atonement. That's interesting we don't want to look at it because it's the second one that should really resonate. Rabbi Ami says, just as a red heifer atones, so do the deaths of tzaddikim, the deaths of righteous people atone. So that sounds very Christian, right? The death of a righteous person atones, that kind of vicarious atonement, which in part is why we called this uh, Leviticus is Christianity and uh, Deuteronomy is Judaism, mostly. What I want to say is that this doesn't come out of nowhere. Even in the Torah, the Aremiklat, the cities of refuge, that place where unintentional murderers, right? We call them manslaughters in American jurisprudence. Um, if someone commits manslaughter, they are not guilty of intentional murder, so they don't have to die. They don't, they're not subject to the death penalty, but they're subject to exile in the refugee city. When do they get out? When the high priest dies. When the high priest dies. So this idea of a righteous person atoning for other people's crimes, right? We actually do see in the Bible in that particular um, setting. Okay, on the right side of your screen, we have this idea of our actions influencing God's presence straight out of the priestly Torah where the sacrifices allow God's presence to be in the camp and transgressions to drive God's presence out. Here we have the essential home of the Shekhinah, the divine presence is in the lower world. But as people begin to sin, the divine presence is repulsed or exiled further and further out into the orbit of the seventh heaven. And then by the time we get to Abraham Avinu, Abraham, our father, Abraham's good deeds brings God's presence back to this realm, right? The lower world, which is the essential home of the Shekhinah. And so this is straight out of the Bible's priestly Torah. And it means that our actions affect or change, or influence God's presence. Now, what we have here is an extension of that idea. It is very, very early in the rabbinic period, the second or the third century. I'm going to read it because it is not self-explanatory, um, as many midrashim aren't self-explanatory. When Israel does the will of God, meaning when they do meet to vote, they make the left hand into the right hand. Okay, left hand is weak, 
right hand is strong. The proof text that they bring for this, the biblical verse that the Darshan, the one writing the Midrash brings to this is, your right hand, Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, Lord, shatters the enemy. So in the context of the song at the sea, when the Israelites are crossing the sea and the Egyptians are behind them, this is a song of victory. And the two right hands, that's just poetic parallelism, right? Your right hand does this and your right hand does that. But the way the rabbi is reading this is that because it says right hand twice, right? God doesn't have two left feet and God doesn't have two right hands. So it must be that we have done God's will and we have turned the left hand into the right hand, thus empowering God to save us. Second half of the Midrash. But when the Israelites do not do the will of the omnipresent, Hamakom, God, as it were, they turn the right hand into the left hand, thereby weakening God. As it says in the book of Lamentations, he has withdrawn his right hand. The book of Lamentations describes the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. What this author is doing is communicating through a midrashic technique the very priest the the priestly idea that our actions cause a reaction in God. What is new here is not about driving God's presence away or bringing God's presence near. It's about strengthening God's presence. So if you want to combine the two ideas, you can say that as God gets closer, God's strength is greater, however it works for you. But it's the same notion that God is naturally reactive to our deeds through our mitzvot and through our transgressions. Okay, that is exactly the headline pulled from yesterday's Jerusalem Post. That when the Torah students, when the yeshiva students in Israel are studying Torah, right, which is the mitzvah par excellence, they are doing even more than the IDF soldiers who are protecting Israel because they, through their Talmud Torah and through their prayers, they're protecting the soldiers in the IDF. Therefore, they shouldn't be drafted. Therefore, the government should fall soon and in our day. That was a political editorial. I'm moving right past that. But I want you to see that this idea is alive and well. It's straight out of um, the priestly Torah as well. Okay. Now, We've seen some of these upcoming slides before, but I want to refresh your memory and I want to put them into the context of where we're going in the, in medieval Kabbalah. So the sacrifices are obviously going to be where we look for the priestly Torah in the rabbinic period. What is so shocking is that there has been a radical innovation in how the rabbis describe the sacrifices in their literature compared to how the Bible in Leviticus described the sacrifices. So what the big difference is, is that in the Torah, the only mental state, the only intention, the only dimension of uh, intention or mental disposition has to do with it, the individual who commits a transgression, whether they meant to do it or whether they didn't mean to do it. When the person comes to bring the sacrifice, doesn't matter what his intention is. And when the priest slaughters the sacrifice in Leviticus, doesn't matter what his intention is. But that changes radically in the earliest layer of rabbinic literature. So I'm just giving you these two quotes to show you um, that right? You've got this 180 degree turn from Leviticus to the rabbis, where in Leviticus, nothing depends upon the mind of the priest. It's all about the actions. That's Howard Eilberg Schwartz. And then Mira Ballberg, I love the name of her book, Blood for Thought, um, 
talks about the sacrificial, the, the dimension of intention and mental disposition being completely absent as part of the sacrificial action, right? Meaning the actual slaughter, the sacrifice of the animal. That's all new in the rabbinic period. And that same attention to intention characterizes not just sacrifice, but the rabbinic substitute for sacrifice once the temple has been destroyed, namely prayer. So we've seen this in previous weeks, right? You can't just say the Shema or read the Shema unless you're intending to read the Shema for the purpose of satisfying the requirement to pray the Shema at a certain time. Okay? So it's not good enough that you are going through the action. Your action has to be accompanied by the intention. And the way that the Mishnah says that at the very bottom of Trumot is, he has said nothing until his heart and mouth are at one. And heart is the biblical and rabbinic way to not just talk about Valentine's Day, not just about your emotions, but also your intellect. So until your intellect and your mouth are at one, you've said nothing. Okay. As we pointed out last week, there was a question in the rabbinic period that Rambam answered in the philosophical mode of, of for whom are the sacrifices? Who benefits? So remember what I told you last week was that according to Rashi and Rambam, the, the command to build a tabernacle was only given, not according to the sequence that you find in the Torah, but was only given after the sin of the golden calf. Because God realized that God's creatures couldn't go from one kind of worship to the other without some sort of intermediate step. And so the building of a tabernacle and the offering of sacrifices were psychological concessions to a slave mentality, the slave mentality of the Israelites, after they had left Israel. The, the quote on the right is from about 80 years after Maimonides wrote The Guide of the Perplexed. And it is from not... Not, Rom, not Rambam, but Ramban, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman in Spain, in Christian Spain. And he's commenting in his Torah commentary on Cain and Abel's sacrifice. And he says, they understood the great mystery of sacrifices and offerings, as did Noah, because Noah also offered a sacrifice. Our rabbis in the Talmud even said that Adam, the first person, sacrificed a bull. And then he says something a little pointed. This should shut the mouths of those whose explanations of the sacrifices generate anxiety and dismay. He's talking about Maimonides. Because if, my, if the sacrifices were psychological concessions, that, then they were for God. Then Nachmanides, Ramban, understands that people might infer from that, that prayer is also for our benefit, not God's benefit. And that would provide opportunities for people to be lax in their observance. And what we have in this moment in the 13th century in Spain is a series of Jewish critiques of philosophy that argue not only is Maimonides wrong, but Maimonides' explanations and the philosophical explanations for the symbolism of the commandments will lead to a laxity in observance. Because as long as people have the right mindset, as long as people know what the commandments are for, 
then if they're in a situation where they don't do the commandments, it's nishke ferlach, it's no big deal, because what's really important, according to the, philo the philosophers, is how you understand the mitzvot, and more important than that is how you understand God's actions in the world. So at the foundation of this argument between the philosophers and the mystics is whether or not the mitzvot themselves are necessary as actions or just understanding that we should be doing things, according to Maimonides, that promote good behavior, that, prom that um, promote understanding the way God works in the world. And it turns out that this idea of whether intention is necessary or altogether sufficient has a root or roots in the rabbinic period itself. So we have this statement that harachmana libabae, that the merciful one desires the heart. Well, does that mean that the merciful one desires the heart along with the commandment, along with the mitzvah, along with the action? Or if you can't do the action, what the merciful one really wants is the heart. And we have that on the right side. Rabbi Ami said, if someone intended to perform a mitzvah, but was prevented from doing so, it is considered as though he has done it. Right? So that's one statement amongst gazillions in the Talmud, but it is recycled in the Middle Ages, and it is something that then becomes... Um, part of the medieval arsenal of the importance of intention. We already took a look at the top left statement last week, but the bottom left statement I have heard from rabbis um, who seem to misunderstand this. So this is a statement at the very end of a Mishnah tractate dealing with a mincha, minachot, uh, a grain offering, that it doesn't matter if you offer a bird or a, or a meal offering or uh, an animal, right? As long as you have directed your heart towards heaven. That does not mean it's the intention that counts because you still have to offer something. You still have to offer an animal or a bird or a meal offering. And then you need to have the direction of your heart toward heaven. So there are these statements that can be confused for emphasizing intention over action, but that's not what Menachot means. And in Shabbat, it's also not what Rabbi Ami is saying, because for Rabbi Ami, you need to have been prevented from performing the mitzvah that you intended to do. So it's in a very specific circumstance. Okay. It seems as though in medieval Spain, there was also a critique by rabbis of Jews that they were going through the commandments without having their heart in it. And so the most important book for about 150 years in Spain, written in Arabic, was what has been described as a Sufi, which is Islamic mysticism, a Sufi handbook of Jewish piety. And it's called Duties of the Heart. And in this book called Duties of the Heart, what Bahia Ibn Bakuda does is to juxtapose duties of the heart and duties of the limb. There are those duties of the limb, the mitzvot that you have to do, but that doesn't preclude you, that doesn't exempt you from duties of the heart. And again, by heart, he means the mind. And he says something that again, seems to privilege, and I don't really want to say seems, it privileges the intention over the action. The thought of a good deed by a true worshiper and his desire to carry it out, even if he proves unable to do so, may be balanced against many a good deed carried out by others. Oh my God, that's a lot more than Rabbi Ami said. So if those good deeds carried out by others don't have the proper kavanah, right, then they can be balanced out by the thought 
of a good deed by somebody who does have the proper kavanah. And he goes on to say, inward obedience, however, is expressed in the duties of the heart, in the heart's assertion of the unity of God, the belief in him and his book. And his book is not the Talmud, but it's the Torah. In constant obedience to God, in fear of God, in humility, love, complete reliance upon God. And then this is just important. I want to point this out. Submission to him. You know how to say submission in Arabic? Islam. A Muslim is one who has submitted to God. And so you can very much hear the echoes of Islamic mysticism and Islamic piety in this. Okay, but this does seem to elevate the intention of the, it seems to elevate the importance of intention over the deed, because it says that the thought of a good deed, even if you can't do it, can be balanced against many a good deed carried out by others who don't have that same intention. Okay, that's, that's radical in Judaism. A little later, so that was 11th century, this is early 13th century, there is a development in the Pyrenees, right, in that area between Spain and France. Um, this group of Jews is called the German Pietists, Hasidei Ashkenaz. It's my impression that not a lot of people know all that much about this group. But this turns out to be a really important transitional group. There were only a couple of books that came out of this very small group, but those books had incredible influence. And because they were published in the Pyrenees, they influenced both what was going on in Spain, in Sfarad, in the Sfaradic world, um, and in Ashkenaz, in the Ashkenazic world. Okay, so this now brings us back into the world of history. Yehuda Hasid's most famous work is called Sefer Hasidim, right? The Book of the Pietists. It's a handbook which charts a course for personal salvation by, quote, striving to discover limitless new obligations hidden in scripture. So new obligations, folks, that we didn't know about before. All aspects of the Hasidic life are to be lived in total dedication to serving God, comparable to the burnt offering that was totally consumed, consumed on the temple altar. So they're looking for new mitzvot, new ways to serve God. And here's the importation and the explanation of the Crusades, right? The Crusades began in 1096 in this area. In the aftermath of the Crusades, when many Rhineland Jews were distraught over the, over the ostensible divine wrath that had, had ravaged their communities, the Hasidei Ashkenaz assumed, as the Mosaic Torah suggests, that the Crusades were a punishment for our sins. Because that's what the Mosaic Torah says. God will punish us for our sins. If so, then the road to redemption would be paved by renewed dedication to a life of divine service. The upside of this Mosaic theology of being punished for your sins is that if you're responsible, if you're complicit in the punishment, you can then pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be responsible for your subsequent reward. We see, we saw this theology after 9-11. Jerry Falwell said that the downing of the Twin Towers was a punishment from God for the United States for American permiss permissiveness of homosexuality. And that the Twin Towers represented Palaces. And so God was punishing us in a way which we could work backwards to know what our sin had been. Very good biblical theology. It's called measure for measure. We have it in the Bible. We have it all over um, 
rabbinic literature. So here is where we get the elements for an explosion of the priestly Torah. An unprecedented and unorthodox component of Ashkenazi piety from these same people, Hasidei Ashkenaz, was an obsession with tshuva, penance, apparently influenced by Christian monastic traditions. Excessive asceticism was perceived as a way to atone for known and unknown transgressions, like the ones that brought on the Crusades. Sefer Hasidim references Isaiah's suffering Messiah, right? That's the Messiah in Isaiah who suffers to atone for the sins of his generation, which is a cornerstone of Christian theology. Vicarious atonement, the notion that one's sins can be absolved by others, provides an opportunity for the Hasidim to atone for the sins of others. If it was other people's transgressions that brought on the Crusades, if Hasidei Ashkenaz can increase the number of mitzvot, and the performance of those mitzvot can atone for those sins that had brought on the Crusades, bring on those extra mitzvot. Specifically, the pietist way of life was imagined to atone for the sins which were responsible for the Christian crusades in the Rhineland, which ravaged local Jewish communities from the late 19th to the early, early 20th century. One of the primary focuses of Hasidei Ashkenaz was prayer. Again, prayer is a substitute for sacrifices. Sacrifices were the mechanism to atone for transgressions. And so they wanted to make prayer bigger and better so that it could be more powerful. So the person that wrote Sefer Hasidim was horrified by even small variations in the text of prayers, as said by the Jews of France and England. If the prayer has been slightly modified and no longer has the correct number, has the correct words or the correct number of words, or if the prayer doesn't know the secrets of prayer or is not worthy of such prayer, then the prayer loses its power to influence God. In other words, Hasidei Ashkenaz has accepted this idea that prayer and all other mitzvot cannot just achieve atonement, but they also influence God. They augment God's power or diminish God's power, just like what we saw in the priestly Torah of the rabbinic period. In the words of Gershom Sholem, the enormous concern shown for the use of the correct phrase in traditional texts and the excessive pedantry displayed in this regard reveals a totally new attitude towards the function of words, a renewed consciousness of the magic power inherent in words. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God created the world through speech. A uh, man creates his world with his wife through speech. A man, therefore, has to dissolve that marriage through speech. Men make vows that cannot be undone. And so this is part of the priestly Torah's power ascribed to the essential potency of language. This has a parallel in the priestly Torah, but it is not new in the Middle Ages because it's in rabbinic material, but this idea that God is within us, right? The divine eminence which animates creation finds its personal corollary in the soul of the individual. Hasid Ashkenaz understands the idea that God is in the Israel on the Israelite side is in your midst by the fact that divinity is within each individual, God dwells within each of our souls. I understand this to be a direct polemic against Christianity. Christianity says that there was one Jew who 
is God and has God dwelling in that person's soul. And Hasidic Ashkenaz says, okay, take your one. But for us, every Jew, not the Christians, for sure not the Christians, but every Jew has God dwelling in their soul. And this then becomes central to further Kabbalah and to Hasidism as well. And this then, I think, really rounds out the inheritance of the priestly Torah. We've got this idea of vicarious atonement, the power of words, the ability to influence God, and ultimately divine imminence. And the divine imminence, right? I want you to think about transubstantiation. I want you to think about the Eucharist. It's through those words that a priest can change the essence of that piece of matzah from a piece of matzah into the flesh and blood of Christ. That's divine imminence. Okay. Now, I'm going to move in a slightly different direction, but we are going to bring it all together in a couple of minutes. The Bahir is the very first Kabbalistic book. It's in Provence, right? Close to the Pyrenees on the French side, 12th century. It asks the question about why the word for sacrifice, korban, has the same three-letter root in Hebrew as karev, to bring close. The answer is that through sacrifice, the Israelites bring near to one another the holy forms, a reference to the Sfirot. That when the Sfirot, those aspects of godliness, are disjointed, are separated, what we can do through our sacrifices, or now what we can do through our prayer with the proper intention, or our mitzvot with the proper intention, is that we can affect divine union where there had previously been separation or disunion. Theurgy, our ability to influence God, is absolutely constitutional to the entire Kabbalistic system. Now, what that means is that the more commandments that we have, the more opportunities we have to bring God together and to strengthen God. I'm going to say that again. Once we understand that mitzvot can strengthen God, that gives us an incentive to generate more mitzvot so that we can make God even stronger. Okay, so I want to just read the right side of this. The Hasidei the Haside Ashkenaz understood the ravages of the First Crusade as a divine punishment that required penance. The scourge of the Crusades did not balance out the cosmos for the sin of the Israelites. Only penance could do that. Furthermore, their theology allowed them to atone vicariously for the sins of others. Their ascetic tendencies, this is the key part, their ascetic tendencies and penitential stringencies recorded in this book that they wrote, and it influenced subsequent halachic codes. So these guys, their idiosyncrasies, their particular theology, their particular way about vicarious atonement and excessive asceticism, they wrote about it as things that they did that others should did, that, that others should do. And that then becomes incorporated not only in the Zohar, but in the Shulchan Aruch as well. This is what I, I this is what I'm particularly happy to bring to people's attention. Because when we talk about the details of Judaism, many of those details emerged in the Middle Ages and were codified by Joseph Caro, the author of, or the compiler, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. And this is what informed his compilation. So this is now 
on the left side is Cherry, on the right side is Jacob Katz. Jacob Katz is the premier historian of, of Halakha um, up until very recently. Uh, he passed away about 25 years ago. The authors of early Kabbalah wrote for a small circle of mystical cognoscente, right? Those in the know. But when it was codified, their pious idiosyncrasies have weighed down the yoke of halakha for all Israel. A handful of halachic innovations emerged with the Zohar, but halachot mentioned in the earlier Bahir had already been given a Kabbalistic interpretation. And Jacob Katz explains the way Kabbalah was able to circumvent standard halachic argumentation. In other words, those innovations by the Bahir and by the Zohar should not have been incorporated into the halakha as the halakha had developed up until that point. But this is what happened. Joseph Caro absorbed Zoharic prescriptions and granted them a higher status than had any halachist before him. He yielded to Kabbalah to the most extent possible for a halachist of his nature, because once a detail, even a minor detail, even if it was of little weight, even if it had been innovated the day before yesterday, once it became Kabbalistically interpreted, once it was understood to actually have the power to move God or to strengthen God, it assumed a metaphysical significance that vindicated its implementation regardless of its place in the halachic hierarchy. In my own words, once these relatively marginal and late halachic details received a Kabbalistic interpretation, then they became part of the mechanism that Jews put into play in order to promote the strengthening of God in order to elicit the felicitous byproduct that God would then be able to protect the Jews. Because in the 13th and 14th and 15th centuries, Things were not good for the Jews, particularly. In 1391, that kicked off 101 years of pogroms and oppression and persecution in Spain, one of the places with the largest Jewish communities. Tens of thousands of Jews converted to Catholicism, some sincerely, some not sincerely. In 1492 was the exile of Spanish Jewry. And so what scholars have pointed out is that as Jews lost power in the physical world, they arrogated to themselves power in the metaphysical world by having them, by giving them the power to influence God and God's strength. The last big chapter of how Kabbalah added to the details of the halakha and the stringencies of the halakha comes with a very, very popular book called Shnei Luchot Abrit, right? Two Tablets of the Covenant by Isaiah Horowitz. Here we see the penetration of the Christian notion of original sin into the Jewish world. And this is a quote from, from Horowitz. The more the pollution of the snake from the Garden of Eden, is manifest, the greater the need for fences around transgressions. It's necessary to add more prohibitions. And Isaiah Horowitz then adds even more fences around prohibitions, right? Increasing the number of stringencies and prohibitions, leaving us with a religion that um, my teacher, Art Green, calls Baroque in its details of halakha. When Jewish observance was lax, the machinery of halakha was engaged to foster greater piety. Joseph Dan, one of the great scholars of Jewish mysticism. The only weapon in the hand of man, Jew, 
when he tries to assist the divine power in its mythological war against evil, are the mitzvot, the ethical and ritual mitzvot, those listed in the halakha, those described in ethical works like Sefer Hasidim, and the many new demands and customs introduced by Isaac Luria and Joseph Caro in Sfat in the 16th century. Every good deed always frees a spark, and every sin always strengthens evil. This, my friends, is the culmination of the priestly halakha in the Middle Ages. And I could end our series right here, but you will see that my title is From the Rabbis to the Priestly Torahs, plural, of the Middle Ages. And so what is that second Torah? I would like to introduce to you a man named Prophet Duran. He was also from that kind of Pyrenees area, Provence, Catalan, uh, educated in Germany in parts. He is not particularly well known outside of the academy. Um, but one of the interesting things about him was that he was forced to convert to Catholicism in 1391 along with tens of thousands of other Jews. Even before he had converted, Prophet Duran lamented the neglect of Torah study within Judaism and lamented the focus on Talmud. And so this particular person, who was a scholar by everyone's estimation, was the greatest champion of learning Torah that had been shown great disdain in his day and in generations prior by the scholars of France, Spain, and Germany. So he wants to promote the study of Torah. So at this point, I want to remind everybody that we have the elevation of both Kavanah and Torah. And the elevation of Kavanah isn't just in the mystical world, it's also for the philosophers, right? It's about what you think, it's about what you understand, it's about what you know, right? Maimonides said the way to love God is to know God, and the way to know God is through the study of nature, through the study of physics. By adopting Kavanah as the defining factor in Jewish identity, Durant solved his own circumstantial problem as well. For him, too, the outer form of being a crypto-Jew or a nominal Christian didn't signify the inner truth. By stamping mechanical observance of the commandments as not only insufficient, the way Bachia did, too, but indeed potentially pernicious and harmful, he has leveled the playing field between Jew and Converso. The performance of a few commandments with full and passionate intention by a converso or a crypto-Jew becomes superior to the perfunctory performance of many mitzvot by, an, by a Jew who has not been converted. Huh. So intention here gets commandeered by the crypto-Jews simultaneous to a larger Jewish elevation of the place of Torah in the curriculum, Duran says, ultimately, that the way to cleave to God is through the Torah, its memorization, and constant contemplation of the Torah, as opposed to the performance of mitzvot, I want you to know that that idea landed. It didn't just flitter out in the crypto-Jewish world. Shlomo Alkabetz of Tzfat, the guy who wrote L'Chad Odi, wrote in 1550 about, for the Torah brings us to a state of cleaving to God. May he be exalted. Because when we cleave to her, the Torah, we also cleave to our creator, since he and his wisdom are one. So in the crypto-Jewish community, 
many of whom then, right, when the opportunity came, went to Spain, sorry, went from Spain to the land of Israel, went to Tzfat, they're bringing this idea of the importance of Torah and clinging to Torah. And now I want to take a step up. This is from David Nirenberg, a guy who wrote a book called Anti-Judaism a few years ago. And he said that the flood of baptism that swept over Spain in the decades around 1400, after the first pogroms in 1391, filled much of the available space between Judaism and Christianity with converts, some sincere, some insincere. And then after 1492, those Jews who didn't convert left, right? The Inquisition wasn't against the Jews. The Inquisition was against those Jews who had converted insincerely. From outside of Spain, as far as Spain's enemies were concerned, their unprecedented evangelical success had created a Jewish empire threatening the world with its tyranny. That just gives you an idea of how Spain was looked at as so Jewish because of their unprecedented evangelical success. This is now from a Jew who had, who had been forced to convert in Portugal, but when he went to Germany, reverted, right? Or when he went to France, when he went to France, reverted to, Ju to Judaism. As a result of forced conversions, the province of Toulouse was sown with Jewish seed. And many of the descendants of these Jewish converts are still uncomfortable in the faith which their ancestors accepted so reluctantly. It would not be far-fetched to assume that these Jewish converts in France stem the Lutheran that from, sorry, from these Jewish converts in France stem the Lutherans who have sprung up everywhere in Christendom. In other words, scholars suggest that it was crypto-Jews and Jewish influence and sincere converts that contributed to the emergence of what became the Protestant Revolution in 1517. Amongst the evidence they include in these arguments is that the critiques of the Trinity that we see in the beginning of the 16th century, they were using Jewish medieval exegesis or parshanut they were using Jewish understandings of the Torah against the church that Jews had been writing in the last several hundred years. And in those disputations that you might have heard of, the claim was made about the humanity of Jesus. And so what we have in the Reformation is sola scriptura, the prominence of the, to of the Torah, of the Bible and nothing but the Bible, a rejection of the Catholic oral tradition, Trinitarianism, and we see the beginnings of humanism and Unitarianism, challenges to original sin at this time, and as we talked about in the first class, or the second class, challenges to the Eucharist, where the Eucharist goes from being understood as as the flesh and body of Christ to a symbol of the flesh and body of Christ. And so what I want to say is that the second priestly Torah of the Middle Ages resulted in Catholicism. And as the crystallization of Catholicism against the challenges of Martin Luther and the other early Protestant, the other early reformers who caused the Protestant revolution forced the Catholic church to become ever more priestly in their particular version of the priestly Torah. 
And with that, I am going to stop and take questions from Ari. Apparently, everything was so clear. There's like no questions. People are like, oh, this was easy. No, I think that uh, there was a lot there. Of Too all much. the three programs, I, I would say this was the was a lot to kind of parse out. So let's, let me try parse out with questions that people are asking. Okay. Number one. Oh gosh. Um, I wonder which is the best way to start. It seems like what you've, what you've outlined now in this four part series is kind of maybe dueling theologies. And when one gains power, the other one reacts to it. So what you just did now was a reaction to Maimonides. Today, today's lecture was a reaction to the prior lecture. That's why you had to be there to understand what Maimonides was arguing, which happens in our society. We always see kind of extremes and it always depends what's going on in the world, right? So in this in this action reaction, Maimonides versus the mystics, let's just say. The first question is, um, Maimonides seems to be a globalist and the mystics seem to be parochial in that Maimonides, as we talked about last week, said that Judaism is a path to being a mensch in the world, acting in the world, but you could have other paths, right? Does it, but it seems like the mystics, the Jewish mystics are saying, no, there is only a Jewish path. In other words, I think that that's what they're saying. Is that correct? That there is a they path, are. it's a mystical it, path, and it's only a Jewish path, or is that only the Jewish path for the Jews? Or is, it, is that the uh, that Jews so have a, a at path this for the point, world? At this point, it's, it's only a Jewish path and only the Jews. Only the Jews have a divine soul. Um, it's very much a reaction to the persecution, the oppression that the Christians in the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, um, placed us under. And the metaphysical explanation for how brutish the Christians were was that they only had the soul of a brute. They only had an animal soul. They didn't have a divine soul. The other piece about the importance of the mitzvot is that it is only the right people with the right intention doing the right things that helps God in this metaphysical war between the forces of holiness and the forces of impurity. And so if you think that God doesn't really need you to do to keep kosher because it's all about health reasons and you can stay healthy um, in other ways, the Kabbalists are coming to tell you that the importance of the mitzvot are through their performance, not through the understanding of their intent. But just to make it clear, According to this theology, Kabbalistic theology, the Jews are basically controlling the, the future of the whole world. Yep. Not just it's not just a path to greater knowledge, learning, and being part of a global world together with other faiths, correct? Right. So the Holy Land is being fought over by the Christians and the Muslims. We Jews have no power in the physical world. But we arrogate to ourselves supreme power in the metaphysical world. And so I want to make sure people understand that when the Chabad people find you in New York City and ask if you put tefillin on or wherever in the world, or they give you candles to light for Shabbat, what they're doing is they want you to do the mitzvot because of this theology that you, if everybody, if all the Jews do it, but they don't ask, they ask, are you Jewish? Oh, have you put your tefillin on? If all the Jews do it, then the Jews, according to this theology that you've outlined, can change God and change the world to bring the Messianic age. Is that correct? That's yeah. what's going on there? And if you think change. about, there's a statement in the Talmud that says, if all Jews were to keep two Shabbatot, the Messiah would come. Now, I always had understood that as rabbinic hyperbole. And it may be, it absolutely may be rabbinic hyperbole. But now that we have uncovered this priestly Torah, that very well could be a statement that if all the Jews would do all the mitzvahs on two Shabbatot in a row, it would make God so strong that it would empower God to bring the Mashiach. There's all kinds of indeterminate 
agadot and halachot in the Talmud that might fit into one category, a priestly category, or might fit into a mosaic category, but we don't really know. But now there is um, an enchantment that these agadot have where we used to just think, oh, you know, that's the rabbis being the rabbis. It's still the rabbis being the rabbis, but it might be this kind of priestly Torah that understands that when we do mitzvot, we turn the left hand of God into the right hand and strengthen God. Right. So we have to all unpack that. Um, people ask about the Zohar. So I don't know if you mentioned the Zohar was apparently published by Moses de Leon somewhere between 1240, 1305. He then attributes it back in history to Shimon ben Yochai, but that's an attribution to give it authenticity. But it comes from this period and what was going on in Spain. I will say, since I was recently in Spain with CSP, this program as part of the Spar Learning was terrific. We were in Catalan. And we were down the south, and, and it's really amazing that you put all this together for, for me in that regard. Um, okay, going back to mystical Judaism versus, can we say, philosophical Judaism, I guess is, could you study both? Or or do you have to kind of be in one camp in the past? And then we'll talk about the present. Um, yeah. Can you be a devotee of both theologies, or is it like either or? Yeah, so I think that, I am a devotee of both, um, and there are certain things that I take from the priestly Torah, certain things that I take from the Mosaic Torah. I am grateful to be an heir to both Torahs, and the person who I think particularly embodies that both model is a guy that um, was one of the students of Prophet Duran, whose name is Chazde Crescus. So Hazde Crescus is um, from northern Spain. His son was killed in those pogroms in 1391. Um, he is he writes like a philosopher and he thinks like a mystic. And his works are not very well known in um, outside, you know, kind of outside of the yeshiva. Um, but he is definitely somebody who incorporates both. And the other group of folks. Ari, who asked that question? I don't recall. It's in the okay. list. So the other group of folks who I think do an amazing job of thinking with both sides of their head, if I can use that expression, or straddling Mount Sinai, um, are the Italian Jews. So from the late 18th century to the early 20th century, there was not a reform movement in Italy. The absence of a reform movement in Italy allowed the traditionalists to not be looking over their left shoulder to have to shore up orthodoxy. So there's a guy named Elijah Benamojeg, who was one of the early respondents to Darwin, um, who, uh, who de- the word is demythologize. He takes some of the mythological silliness out of the Kabbalah, um, and he's very much, you know, very much a Maimonidean. Um, Samuel David Luzzato is another one of these Italians. Um, but Benamojeg is best known in the Jewish world for popularizing Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the seven Noahide laws. Um, so he was somebody that, you know, really did understand, like Maimonides, that all of us are created in the divine image, that um, there's different ways to God, and that Judaism's way for Gentiles necessitates these seven laws. But beyond that, in addition to that, right, there's lots of different paths. Um, today, when we look at the, let's say, American Judaism, and we have... Haredi world, black hat world, modern orthodoxy, conservative, reform, reconstructionist. Uh, I mean, it goes on, right? Um, can you say basically that your outline of Judaism shows where the break is? That if you're in, the, maybe even in modern orthodoxy to conservative and so on, you're in these this mosaic law. But if you're, and I don't know where the break is, but if you're in the conservative world, you are not thinking that your deeds, your mitzvot, 
are um, affecting God, I don't think. Um, and therefore, you're because you're not following every halacha, you certainly aren't in Reform Reconstructionists. Whereas if you're in the Haredi world, you certainly are. In the modern Orthodox, I don't know. But yes. is so are we basically, you know, the reason we can't talk to each other in a way is because we're living two different theologies. We're Jewish. So, so let's you, let's start with the ultra-Orthodox world, okay? So within Haredi, the Haredi you know, world, ultra-Orthodoxy ultra -Orthodoxy in Hebrew is called Haredi. Right. You've got two groups. You've got the Hasidim and the opponents of the Hasidim. The opponents of the Hasidim are called the Misnagdim. Both, both, both of the Hasidim and the Misnagdim are Kabbalists. The difference is that the Misnagdim don't believe that we can ever intellectually, cognitively access the divine that is imminent in the world through anything other than Torah. That we just don't have the faculties, we don't have the intellectual faculties to experience divinity in the world. The Hasidim believe that we do. And that's why the Hasidim try to access God through everything in the world, not just Torah, not just the study of Torah, but in food and in nature and in dancing and in shots of vodka. So there's a theological difference there that we haven't yet gotten to. That's something that comes out in the 18th century. And Ari, we are all heirs to conflations of the priestly Torah and the Mosaic Torah, just like the rabbis were heirs to both. And there were some um, laws and ideas that incorporated both. Every subsequent version of Judaism is an heir to what came before it. So it's very like, you're not really going to see a distilled priestly Torah or a distilled Mosaic Torah. My interest in this as a rabbi is to help chained women who are divorced and their recalcitrant husbands refuse to give them a get, to give them a divorce. I know what I want to happen. I feel like if I can explain that we should be more proactive on the side of the woman as a result of our rejection of this idea of words creating new realities that formed their marriage and therefore uh, the, the man's word is required to dissolve the marriage. I feel like Jewishly that makes me feel better and gives me a stronger argument to be able to then help those agunot, to help those chained widows. Right, they're not always widows. Those those chained women to recalcitrant husbands, um, but there's other ways in which I think conservative Jews and specifically um, adherents of Heschel understand that deeds of righteousness, deeds of loving kindness, deeds of compassion do strengthen God. It's not the ritual deeds that strengthen God; it's the ethical deeds, and so that's the line that. <clears throat> that Abraham Joshua Heschel and Art Green have pushed. And so it gets a little messy when you try to slot in biblical theologies into contemporary denominations. Well, other than giving us lots to think about, I think what you've shown us is that the depth and beauty of our Judaism is that it has these strands in it. And sometimes the strands are mixed and sometimes they're separated and depends on the person and where you are for Shabbat, I guess whether it's in a shul, what shul you're in, whether you're at home or you're at the beach. and um, But at least you can look into your Judaism and see these. So I, what, I, what I think everyone is saying is we appreciate that you've kind of taken it apart a bit for us. The last question, well, there's two last questions. One is, I think what you've shown is that historical context is important to understanding the evolution of Judaism. Is that, is, do you think that basically Judaism, you know, is incredibly influenced by its surrounding political situation. So it's not just like a Judaism that was given. I mean, I think I think you think this obviously, but but there is a serious impact on what's going on in the world to understand the evolution of Judaism where it is today. Yeah, and I think the most important recent development <clears throat> to demonstrate the truth of that is that now you pretty much can't be a Talmudist if you don't know Sasanian Persian. 
right? If you can't read the other literatures that the rabbis in Babylonia who contributed to the Babylonian Talmud were reading, then you can't claim to be an expert on the Babylonian Talmud. That is a, a relatively new phenomenon. Yaakov Elman from Yeshiva University is the guy that pioneered. He he learned Sasanian uh, Persian and Shai Sekunda, you know, and I think one of the last books that Shai Sekunda wrote was called the Babylonian, the sorry, the Persian Talmud instead of the Babylonian Talmud. Um, yeah, you know, whether it's Kant or whether it's the American pragmatists, look like um, Mordechai Kaplan was so influenced by the school of American pragmatism. So we've got it, you know, pretty recently um, in American Jewish history as well. But whether the influence is Hellenistic, Christian, uh, Persian, Aristotelian in the Middle Ages, Sufi, right? You know, we were, I, I hate to break it to you folks, but we're an itsy bitsy teensy weensy people. And we have made outrageously disproportionate contributions to the world. And we have been heavily influenced by what's going on in that outside world and to our benefit. People here, people here have recommended that we take the Haredim in Israel who believe sincerely that they are saving Israel and the world, and we just parachute them into Gaza tomorrow. And maybe that will solve the problem and we'll get our hostages back. Is that, is that a fair statement? We can uh, always don't, try don't it. That. You, Ari, you don't know until you try. I think we should take some of them. I know some here who told me that. We put on our tefillin <laughs> and, and God will protect us in Israel. And I was like, okay, well, we'll send you in first. Um, last question, Judaism and Christianity. So you talked about kavanah intention. That seems to be really where Christianity is. It's not about necessarily deed. It's about thought. It's about what you think in your heart, what you believe. And that that's way more important than actually actions. I mean, there's no, there's not, the mitzvot have been replaced, right? And so, so that's the, that's the beef between Protestantism and Catholicism, right? We're not even talking about Eastern Orthodoxy. Let's just 